today's topic is uh, training deep auto encoders for uh, collaborative filtering. Uh, so this is the paper from NVIDIA and the title itself is like a um, bunch of keywords, collaborative filtering and auto encoders. So let's just talk. So collaborative filtering is one of the approaches for uh, recommender systems. So let's just talk about it. So basically there are like two types of recommender systems. The one is uh, context based and the other is personalized recommendations. So in context-based recommendations, uh, the system takes into account the factors such as location, date, and time. So based on your location, date, and time, you will be recommended a product. And the other type of systems is personalized recommendations. So based on your taste, based on your preferences, you will be recommended um, item, let's say a movie or an item from uh, from Amazon or something else. So, uh, so as the paper talks about uh, collaborative filtering, so let me just explain you what's um, what's up with this collaborative filtering. So, throughout the presentation, I'm going to represent CFS collaborative filtering. So, this is a typical scenario in a CF. So, you are given a matrix, so where each row represents a user and each column represents a item so here it's a movie so this is movie one this is movie two movie three and this is user one two three and four and this each element of the matrix is the uh, a rating given by user one for movie one this is uh, this is the rating given by user two for movie one and this question mark represents the user is yet to read this movie so the uh, a typical system could have a question mark or a zero in here. So remember, uh, if there is a zero in here, it means the user is yet to uh, predict for the movie too. So, so overall task of the um, CF approach is to predict what should be the value over here instead of zero. And so there is a whole lot of different math. I mean, the traditional approach is to use uh, to form a bunch of uh, linear equations with uh, two unknown variables and then solve them and I mean there's um, a bunch of math that goes in here and if you're interested to look into the math it's uh, it's over here on this link but this paper is not about this uh, traditional math but it's the it's about to predict these values uh, with the help of deep learning models so this is how the uh, this is what the uh, model that the authors have used they have used an auto encoder and the scale exponential linear units. So this is one of the activations functions, just like, it's just like leaky ReLU. Um, they use high dropout rates uh, to avoid overfitting, and they use this uh, MMSC loss function, and they use something, uh, a novel approach known as uh, iterative output refeeding during training. So we'll be talking about in detail in coming slides on each of them. So for those um, who don't know what an encoder, auto encoder is, um, so basically it maps the function f of x equals to x. So x is the input, and again the output is x. But the uh, but the magic is the stuff happens uh, in the hidden layers. So so the first half is an encoder, and the second half is the decoder. So the encoder takes an input image and uh, passes through the hidden layers. So I mean, so you can see the the size of the hidden layers is, has been, is been decreasing till the, uh, till the till at the middle at the very middle of the hidden layer. So it encodes the let's say uh, ten dimensions into four dimensions. So we can see that this image can be uh, reduced into four dimensions or let x number of uh, dimensions, and then. It, it uh, the decoder accepts this uh, encoded image and it uh, produces the original output. So input and output is same, but the um, the hidden layer is the encoded image of the input. So this is this was the um, uh, detail about the auto encoders and uh, depending on the uh, depending on the project that you are having you can have different layers different layers hidden layers and different sizes of the hidden layers you can have different um, activation functions different loss functions and whatnot so the so the paper also talks about um 
Okay. Uh, Amit, can you unmute your uh, mute your mic? Sorry. So uh, the paper also um, talks about uh, an activation function, uh, scale exponential linear units. So as you can see, this is the graph of the activation function, uh, and it is almost um, similar to leaky relu, except the leaky relu will just go this, uh, will have a line over here. So uh, this is what the function looks like. Lab, they have uh, two variables. I mean, not the variables, they are the scalar values and they are not tradable. So typically this lambda value is about 1.05 and the alpha value is about 1.65. So it turns out that this function is um, useful for the faster conversions. And this function is also useful to avoid the um, gradient vanishing and the gradient overshooting. So how it does, it's, um, it's out of the scope of the paper and m for me as well, but uh, so far as I have researched about the topic, it's uh, this function is this uh, activation function is useful uh, for the faster convergence. Uh, I have, I guess, I have also um, attached few links in here. Uh, yeah, so so this two links talks talks more about the uh, this activation functions, and I'm gonna also share you these slides. So if you can, uh, if you want to go into the math and the details of the function. So they also have a, <coughs> a loss function. So they use something called a masked mean square error loss. So we all know about mean square error loss, but I mean, you think it's, this is, this is like really close to mean square error loss, except for the fact that uh, they have one more function as MI. <coughs> so <coughs> RI is the actual rating and YI is the predicted rating. So remember in the, the output, the input looks like this. And uh, loss function looks like this. So if, so if the RI is zero, they will set this uh, MIS to be zero. Because if, remember if, we, if the input is zero, it means over here, if the input is zero, then the user is yet to predict the rating of that movie. So we don't want the, our model to learn uh, zero. In fact, we want our model to predict the value zero, um, to predict the value instead of zero, so which it thinks that it's the correct value. So that's why we just will just mask the function, the loss as zero if the input is zero. So if the input is zero, uh, if the R is zero, M I is zero, so the loss function is zero. So, so the, I mean, so which will uh, which will prevent the model to learn from the value zero it will uh, predict the value that's different from zero so they also talk about the another approach known as iterative output refeeding they also i mean it can also be said as dense refeeding according to paper and these are the words exactly taken from the paper and basically what they mean to say is uh, they take the so they take the input, they get the output, they also get the error, they back propagate the error, and they once they got the output, they also pass that output as input. And again, uh, the, out, the it goes through the layers and again, they get the error and again, they back propagate. So how many times they do it, the paper, don't, uh, paper doesn't discuss about it, but I assume uh, they do it twice, I guess, because yeah, that's quite, quite intuitive. So uh, let's talk about some results over here. <clears throat> so this is one of the graphs. Uh, I mean, they say that, uh, they, so basically they want to argue that the high dropout rates have, have, have been proved to be a faster, uh, a better convergence as compared to uh, zero dropout rates, but they haven't shown the graph of 0 point, uh, 0 0.25 dropout, but they from zero, they directly jump from 0 0.5, 0 0.65 and 0.8. But I, I think they should have also shown a uh, graph for dropout 0.25 because that, same, that also seems to be performing well, but okay. And with the, 
so so with this uh, dense refeeding approach they say that uh, so this is one of the other graph so they have compared the dense refeeding approach with the uh, bunch of baselines and they have like different learning rates so so they want to, so this green line is um, converging faster than baseline models so this green line is happy with the one with the uh, dense refeeding and they also have a higher learning rates so basically what they want to argue is that uh, dense refeeding uh, is only useful with the higher learning rates where they have compared the baseline and the, the dense refeeding with lower learning rates but the higher learning, learning rates have to be have proven to be performed like better than the rest of the others so uh, to conclude um, <clears throat> so this is the um, item based model so um, you see the, the columns would be the items. So this is the item based model, but in real world, I mean, real world recommender system would be user based model. So you can, you can assume that each column should represent a user. So, so with what, so this is like, uh, you can assume that the, uh, the input. So for the real, real world on recommender system, the input is like the transpose of this input metrics. But what if we are talking about real world, then that would be like much more, much more number of users as compared to that of items. So there will be like, let's say a million items, but for like every million, there will be like 1 billion users. So if we take the transpose of this metrics, then you can easily, you can easily imagine that the number of columns is less than number of, uh, number of rows, sorry, my bad. The number of rows is less than the number of columns. So if you have um, uh, input data, which have a very high number of columns as compared to that of rows, then uh, typically that data is just not um, easy to train. So that's why they also say that this model is uh, less practical as compared to, uh, rec to real world recommender systems. But this model has been proven to be performed in perform better for this Netflix data, data sets. But yeah, they also say that uh, this this approach is less practical than user-based model. So basically, this paper was like rejected from uh, one of the uh, prestigious machine learning conferences because this paper lacked uh, novelty. But yeah, I would say this paper. I would say this paper. I mean, also had like a bunch of mistakes in in here uh, the, the bunch of typos which made me difficult to uh, learn through it and i referred like a bunch of references in order to um, understand and go through it what what they are actually trying to say yeah so any questions Um, I have one. Tell yep. Yeah. First of all, yeah. Thanks for doing this amidst the Black Friday weekend. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, yes. So the question what I had was coming to your. Um, so this is an auto encoder, right? So it has encoding layers, or in other words, embedding layers in them because yeah. of the encoder part of it, right? Mm -hmm. So at this point, it's only taking. Um, a user ID and, a, and an item ID uh, in like a pivoting matrix and then the uh, values are like the ratings, correct? Um, it doesn't take the IDs, but it takes the um, the ratings. No, 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 what I mean is so uh, user I uh, rated item J3 and then user I rated item, no, user I rated item K0, that means they're not inter interactive with the item yet, correct? Yep, yep. Yeah, so the rows are users and the columns are items. Yeah. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my question was, so there are a lot of data sets, so uh, which which take in other factors of the off factors of the user or other factors of the items. So what I mean is, um, I don't care if the user ID is 2595 and they're just part of any random point in the globe. Let's say I want to see how well a user in a 
particular uh, geographic area or like a particular demographic group uh, is interacting with um, an item. So what I mean is, let's say um, people in the, people in New York invest more in winter clothes than people in California. Correct? You get what I'm saying? Hello? Hello? Yep. Uh, yeah, sorry. My, I was I was disconnected. Okay, I see. Yeah, so you get what I'm saying, right? So uh, at this point, it's just the ID. So it's like a singular point. So how do I... My, I guess my question is, if in case I want to add these features into it, do I just concatenate them uh, as one hot encoder categories again and then feed them into auto encoder? So or I cannot. So you want to add features of uh, item, a uh, product? Uh, user or item, either way. I mean, there is no, uh, yeah, so there is no such thing as a feature in this approach because it only takes the uh, ratings of uh, ratings given by a user to each and every item. So, uh, let me yeah, so no, what I'm telling you yeah. is, no, so no, my, my question, so if, when, you're, when you're building a recommender system, you, you mm -hmm. don't just go up to the user ID, right? Yeah. You need to look into other aspects of it. So, new people in California won't care if I give them snow coats because it barely sure. snows over there, right? So, mm -hmm. sure. so, how do I, so how do I learn those features of a user or maybe learn those attributes of an item um, yeah. from the data. So let's say in this case, they didn't have the features, they didn't use the features or they didn't have the features at all. But mm -hmm. something as simple as movie lens, I remember it has uh, demographic stuff about the user, like what's their age group, are they married, male, female, etc., etc. So I want to see, so what if I want to see what population of male people, male uh, viewers watch comedy and what uh, population of female mm -hmm. watch action. So such kind of target. So I, instead of just going at one single pinpointed user ID or item ID, mm -hmm. can I add those attributes as well as into the auto encoder? Um, I mean, according to me, I mean, so far as I have understood is that um, if let's say we, we are talking about people in California, then uh, mm -hmm. they would have, they would have so, sort of same uh, ratings. I mean, if, if we are talking about you, then you would have sort of same ratings for uh, the people living in California, right? So your your whole row, this your row would not have uh, the ratings for, uh, uh, let's say, snow items, but would have ratings for the items that are used in California. And same would go, I mean, you would not be, it would, I mean, you would not be the only alone row which will have the same fashion, but you will have a bunch of different California uh, users will have, which will have the same sort of pro structure. So based on the similarity of your ratings and the people in California, you will be rated the next, uh, a new product. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, coming to that point, let's say uh, some guy in New York, let's say you and I have in equal interest in everything, mm -hmm. but then uh, you are forced to buy a winter jacket in the winter. And mm -hmm. I am not. So according yeah. to the model, it will think that, okay, these two user IDs are very close. And this mm -hmm. guy has bought this really good North Face jacket and yep. he's given a five-star rating. So let's let's recommend this guy from California as well, a winter jacket, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, that would be a caveat. So I, I wouldn't mind seeing it. I don't care about it. But sure. imagine if multiple users are given stuff, which they don't even care about, which they don't even need. Um, in that case, attributes like these, like the dem geographical attributes sure. of the user would come into play, right? Sure, so sure. Is there a way that I can add them as features? Do I just concatenate these one hot encoder sparse uh, vectors into the input and make the dense layer of the autoencoder input dense layer of the autoencoder much more bigger? Or um, do I just, just chuck it? Yeah, so that could be one of the approach that we can be, we can be, we can uh, sure use I mean, you can also have one more layer as a feature and just pass into auto encoder. We can, we can sure do that, but uh, this paper just doesn't talk about it. And it, sh it says that um, underlying, I mean, if two people have same taste, they have high likelihood of having the same opinion. 
So you, remember I said, I mean, if, you, if you're a citizen of California, then you would have sort of same uh, preferences and tastes uh, as compared to the people in California. So this is this approach just uh, assumes that this is true. And so far as you, uh, your question is concerned, then for sure we can we can try, try out a bunch of stuff which take into account like features such as geographical uh, geography, the age, the as well as the uh, ethnicity. Because I mean, what what not? Yeah. So we can for sure use these features uh, as an input to auto encoder, and we can sure it, it needs to be investigated how it performs. Okay. Okay. Cool. That's that's what I wanted to ask. I think Michael had some feedback as well. Michael, you wanna chip in? Um, yeah. Sure. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Yes. Loud and clear. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, we. I think we are safe to assume that the embedding layer in the audio encoder is is a good representation of all the information that mm -hmm. the audio encoder learns about the item collaborative filtering model. So why not use that as a, as a feature vector in addition to the other features you'd like to use and build a new model, even like a linear model or something oh, okay. uh, simpler to, to uh, incorporate these other features. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, so use this embeddings as the input for a mm -hmm. different model, which also takes the uh, features that Sharad just talked about. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that yeah, that also sounds really good. Uh, yeah, it should be investigated. And yeah, as a matter of fact, I have I have done some sort of thing in one of my past past projects, and I can say that it yeah it it, it sure performs good. So basically, what we did, I mean, I was working for the crowdsourcing platforms, and basically we kind of did similar. We passed the images and got the embeddings and uh, aligned those embeddings with the bunch of new features. Uh, so that we can build out a good recommender system for the people on the crowdsourcing platforms. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I think if I heard Michael right, um, he meant that build multiple autoencoders depending on uh, different interactions that you want to take into consideration and get embeddings, uh, reduced dimension embeddings of all the models and then just build a simple MLP or a linear model on top of that to, to get the uh, recommendation. That's what you mean, Michael? Yeah, I mean, you're welcome to try that, whatever, uh, you know, I, mm -hmm. you could do other autoencoders or just any sort of model, just use those features as the, mm -hmm. the so you have a, a customer profile um, uh -huh. included in that profile is all the ratings that they've contributed and of course, et cetera, mm -hmm. all the rating data you have. So this embedding layer can be interpreted as a very compact representation of all that information. Mm -hmm. sure. So you can that in a different But uh, the one thing is I'm not sure that, I mean, this model is, um, this model predicts the future ratings of the user. So let's say this is uh, zero. So it will uh, predict what would be the value, what would be the rating instead of zero. So I'm not sure how that will play out uh, uh, in predicting these uh, zero or question mark values uh, with that approach. Um, um, I don't know. Well, it should, right? It's just another, it's going to be a regression model altogether. So you, you need to train your model on top of the features that you engineer on. So it would be able to uh, give you the explicit rating. Mm, um, maybe, yeah. Because uh, how, um, one of the approaches of this model is um, So let's say uh, this, this. I mean, this is a row of one row of one of the users, and this is these are the movies. So for each movie, the the user has rated, but these zeros, the uh, user is not rated for those movies. So what they do is while training, they just get the um, let's say first nine movies and train the model, and they just, they they use this movies. They they use this data for the testing of it. So they pass this as a training data and. This is the testing data. So um, I'm not sure how that will play out uh, with the um, embedding approach, but yeah, I mean, sure. We, I mean, yeah, someone should try that thing and see if it outperforms this model. Sure. Cool, cool. Thanks, Kavan. Yeah, any other questions? 
Yeah, a quick question. Um, looking at, they use this masking to um, basically, they don't consider errors for those movies without ratings. Yeah. So they use a, a masking on the loss. Um, mm -hmm. But then with this refeeding step, do they do they apply the mask or do they not? Do they remove the mask for the refeed? So apparently they do. So what it does is, um, so f at first they, uh, so at first they pass the input, get the loss. Uh, so what this mask function is useful in doing is, um, let's say you have zero in here, right? But if you just don't pass the, um, um, so if you just mask, mask the error as zero for the input values as zero, then you will have a value over here that is not with a non-zero value over here. So it helps the model to uh, sort of predict the value instead of zero. And they pass, uh, they pass this, the same values uh, again, in the, in, again in the model because it can for sure have like multiple zeros and it takes a while to, uh, to learn accurately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other question, guys? Hello? Um, that's it from my end. Mm -hmm. Um, any other question, guys? Amit Pranav, <laughs> New York guys. So, um, okay, I guess we have some. Oh, okay, thanks. You're welcome. So uh, I will also share my uh, presentation and it has like a bunch of um, references. You can refer the math if you want. And it also, yeah, so this link is to the traditional math for the collaborative filtering. Yeah, I'm going to share this on, on the general channel. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome, guys. So um, I'm going to sign off and I wish you have a happy weekend. And yeah, see you guys on Monday. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. See ya.